We're live now. Thank you. Okay, so Vince, I'm going to mute myself and uh, gradually unmute to welcome people and let them know that we'll get started shortly after the top of the hour. Do that too. Should I do that too? Sure. For those of you who are arriving, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us for our program this evening. Uh, we're going to give uh, the group several minutes to arrive and we'll get started very shortly after the top of the hour. Welcome. Welcome to all of you who are joining us this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you at our program. Um, I'm keeping my eye on the participant list and we will get started uh, shortly after the top of the hour once we have some, some more of the uh, registrants in attendance. So thanks again for being here.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program. I'm just going to give it a few more minutes until some more of our uh, registrants have arrived in, and I see them in the participant list and we will get started very shortly. Thanks again and welcome. Okay, I'm back. Somehow, somehow the internet died there. Well, I'm glad we're glad to see you. And with that, why don't we get started? Uh, seeing as our distinguished presenter has uh, re returned to um, the panel, I want to take a moment to uh, thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening and wish you a very good evening. Um, welcome to another installment of the Rosenbach's 2021 celebration of Bloom's Day, our annual commemoration of James Joyce's remarkable literary masterpiece, Ulysses. While Bloom's Day is on June 16th, we're delighted to bring you an entire month of programming that offers interesting insights into James Joyce's work. My name is Alex Ames, and I work as Collections Engagement Manager at the Rosenbach, and I'm so happy that you have joined us for our exciting program this evening. As many of you are surely aware, the Rosenbach holds the manuscript of Ulysses, which truly makes us a central nodal point in the world of James Joyce studies. I would add that stewarding this historic manuscript, that is the physical object, um, also imbues the Rosenbach with the responsibility to steward the manuscript's interpretation as a piece of really important cultural heritage, and that's a responsibility that we take very seriously. For the second year in a row, our Bloomsday celebrations are largely, though not entirely, virtual as the world slowly tries to heal from a deadly pandemic. And the United States and many other nations around the world continue to grapple with the ever present consequences of colonialism and imperialism. As part of our Bloomsday celebrations this year, we at the Rosenbach wanted to think about what James Joyce has to say to the modern United States through his classic work. As my colleagues and I in the collections department at the Rosenbach pondered this question, we were deeply thrilled by and grateful for the innovative scholarship of tonight's presenter, Dr. Vincent Cheng, who opened our eyes to new ways of seeing and understanding Joyce's politics, his worldview, and his message to modern society. And I know that he will do the same for you as well. Before we dive into our presentation this evening, I want to um, sort of give you some contextual information about our Bloomsday celebration at the Rosenbach, both in its virtual component and in its um, on-site component so that you can continue to stay in touch as we celebrate this season. So um, allow me to tell you just a few details about our, our current and upcoming program programmatic offerings. First off, I just want to extend a warm thank you to our sponsors. Bloom's Day is made possible uh, this year in 2021 through a generous grant from the Consulate General of Ireland's Emigrant Support Program. And we at the Rosenbach also extend a special thanks to Lenore H. Steiner and Perry A. Lerner. It's truly an honor and a privilege to work with these individuals and organizations, as well as all of our uh, members and supporters at the Rosenbach to bring you programs like this one. We have uh, some other upcoming Bloomsday events. Unfortunately, our, uh, or fortunately, I guess I should say, our Spirit of Bloom cocktail mixing workshop uh, on June 12th has sold out, but we do have another upcoming free virtual program, Love's Old Sweet Song, The Music of James Joyce, a harp recital that will be broadcasted live from the Rosenbach's historic par uh, parlor on Thursday, June 24th. You can learn more about these and other programs at rosenbach.org bloomsday. I also am really thrilled to share 
uh, that the Rosenbeck will be debuting a feature length film, if you can believe it, titled I Said Yes, A Celebration of Bloom's Day at the Rosenbeck. This film will debut, will premiere on Wednesday, June 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. You can watch it at rosenbeck.org slash bloomsday or at facebook.com slash Rosenbeck Museum. My colleague Edward Pettit and uh, many others at the Rosenbeck have worked very hard on this, on this film and I'm so excited to watch it and learn more about Bloomsday at the Rosenbeck. Finally, I do also want to uh, in, invite you to visit the Rosenbach in person if you're comfortable doing so uh, and see our installation, The Global Other, Race and Empire in James Joyce's Ulysses. You can explore our garden as well and see plants uh, connected to Joyce's work. Learn more at rosenbach.org slash visit. And while you're online, why not pick up some great Rosenbach Bloomsday merchandise? I would invite you to visit the Rosenbach online shop. My colleague Brianna, I know, is entering some URLs in the chat box for you all. And I would invite you to um, support us by buying some of these great products that we are able to offer. So check, check that out when you have a chance. Thank you so much for being a part of the, the Rosenbach community. You know, it's been quite the challenging year and a half for all of us, including at the Rosenbach. It's also been a time of great innovation as we've developed virtual programs like this one. The best way for you to show your support of what we do beyond just attending the programs, and we're so grateful to have you here, is to make a, a financial contribution to help keep us going during these difficult times. Um, it would mean a lot to me. I know it would mean a lot to all of our colleagues. So please visit rosenbach.org slash donate to uh, make a contribution and support the work that we do in cultural programming at the Rosenbach. This uh, special in conversation with program that we bring you this evening is really being presented as a companion piece to that gallery installation that I mentioned earlier titled The Global Other, Race and Empire in James Joyce's Ulysses. If you live in the area, I invite you to come see the installation in person. For those of you who are at a further distance or may not yet be comfortable visiting a museum indoors, I'm pleased to tell you that we've made all the content of the installation available via our Gallery Gateway online exhibition portal. My colleague Brianna will share a link to the Gallery Gateway in the chat box, and I hope that you'll check it out. The Rosenbach Collections Department consulted with Dr. Cheng, our uh, distinguished speaker this evening, on this installation, which is a useful complement to the topic of tonight's discussion, the will to forget memory, the nation, and Ulysses. We'll begin with Dr. Chang's spoken remarks, and if you have questions during the course of the presentation, please enter them in either the chat box or the Q&A box uh, via your um, sort of menu of tools in, here in Zoom. If you enter your questions in the Q&A box, only those of us who are presenters or panelists will be able to see them, and if you enter them in the chat box, you can pose questions and comments that everyone can see. Brianna has kindly agreed to monitor the chat box and help me keep track of questions uh, once we get to that uh, stage of the presentation. It's truly an honor and a privilege for me to introduce to you Dr. Vincent J. Cheng, who is the Shirley Sutton Thomas Professor of English and Distinguished Professor at the University of Utah. He is the author of many scholarly books and articles, including Joyce, Race, and Empire, published by Cambridge University Press, which was the inspiration of our gallery installation this Bloomsday, uh, as well as other numerous other books, including Shakespeare and Joyce, A Study of Finnegan's Wake, um, Inauthentic, The Anxiety Over Culture and Identity, and most recently, Amnesia and the Nation, History, Forgetting, and James Joyce, which was published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2018. His work addresses the intersections of post-colonial studies, race studies, 20th century literature, and contemporary culture. Welcome to the Rosenbach community, Dr. Chang, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Alex, for that generous introduction. Um, I'm assuming, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, the Rosenbach Museum for inviting me uh, to speak to you tonight. Um, and uh, I would also uh, like to thank the folks at the Rosenbach who have worked with me on this, um, and uh, including um, Ed Pettit, Brianna Meyer, Rosa Darty, Hillary Nayberg, 
And most of all, um, Judy Gustin and especially Alex Ames, uh, both of whom have been a pleasure to work with um, uh, on this presentation. You know, in the wake of Joyce Race and Empire, uh, my thinking after having written that book first led me to work as a natural continuation on issues having to do with Irishness, quote unquote, and the construction of Irish identity in the colonial slash post-colonial nation. This then led me more recently to consider how nations retrospectively construct a national history and national identity via historical memory, nostalgia, and amnesia especially in the case of Ireland and its legacy of empire and colonialism. My talk today discusses these particular issues using Joyce's Ulysses and Irish colonialism for specific textual examples and analysis. It will take, I think, about 40 minutes. Let me begin on a personal note. Although I am known among my family and friends for having a good memory, I have long been aware since my childhood of the attractions, even the desirability of forgetting. Indeed, in my teens and twenties, I used to regularly experience what I grew to call amnesia fantasies. That is wish fulfillment fantasies in which I imagined that I found myself suffering from amnesia and having no idea who I was. In that condition, I could be, of course, unburdened of my own troubles and free to move on. I suspect I'm not alone in having had such fantasies. After all, who has not, in periods of unhappiness, wished to be someone else, or at least wished to be able to slough off one's own past and identity and what Joyce's character, Stephen Dedalus, refers to as the nightmare of history? And what more attractive and dramatic fantasy? even more attractive than Freud's notion of family romance, than to obliterate one's own personal past and identity by finding oneself an amnesiac. Of course, the discourses of Western culture are always enjoining us to remember, not to forget, warning us instead about the dangers of forgetting. You know, um, those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Uh, the Holocaust enjoins Jews to never forget uh, just as the Hebrew Bible reminded them always to remember Zion, even by the rivers of Babylon, we are each urged to remember our roots, our identity. Trauma victims are coaxed into recovering repressed memory so that they may heal and move on, and so on. Hardly anyone ever talks about the desirability or usefulness of forgetting. Indeed, amnesia as a neurological condition is always represented as a negative thing, um, a loss of a personal identity that one desperately needs to recover. After all, one's identity is basically constituted of one's memories. The ultimate version of amnesia is arguably Alzheimer's disease, which in its advanced stages constitutes both the total loss of memory and the total loss of identity. Yet I would suggest that our culture also has a collective fascination with amnesia. Actual amnesia as a medical condition is an extremely rare occurrence. Yet in popular culture, it is an extremely frequent occurrence, almost ubiquitous. Stories of amnesiacs are the stuff of spy novels, mystery novels, popular films, television soap operas, science fiction, sensational tabloid journalism, and so on. Um, could I have the first slide, please, Alex? Think, for example, of the popularity of the novels and films uh, of the Bourne Supremacy, the Bourne Identity, the Bourne Ultimatum, and Jason Bourne. Films like Memento and The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a host of mystery, science fiction, and psychological novels with titles like Amnesia, Amnesia Moon, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, um, the very first episode in 1973 of the daytime television staple *The Young and the Restless* was a story about an amnesiac. We could each immediately name uh, a number of such examples of our collective cultural fascination with amnesia. 
in spite of the fact that almost no one has ever personally met or known an actual amnesiac. So what is it about amnesia that is so fascinating and even attractive to our collective consciousness? Is it a trope for something deeper, something repressed? At the very least, what this phenomenon suggests to me is that we have, in fact, a cultural will to forget, a compulsive attraction slash a fascination for the idea of a clean slate. After all, this notion and the corollary ability to remake, remake oneself is a longstanding and defining American tradition, at least, from Benjamin Franklin to the novels of Horatio Alger uh, to Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. It is as if we have a need, even if in fantasy, uh, to erase one's past from one's memory. One of the most famous and defining examples of clinical amnesia was the case of the World War II soldier who was shot in the head at the Battle of Smolensk. Uh, next slide, please. The great Russian psycho psychologist, Alexander Romanovich Luria, told his story in a book titled, The Man with a Shattered World, The History of a Brain Wound. Next slide, please. This is the, the, the Russian soldier at the Battle of Smolensk uh, who was shot in the head and lost his memory. Um, Luria also recorded a very different case history in a second book called The Mind of a Nemonist, um, a little book about a vast memory. Next slide, please. The Mind of a Nemonist spelled that way uh, as in Mnemosyne, the Greek goddess uh, of memory. Um, the history of a brain wound, wound is the story of the wounded amnesiac soldier. Um, uh, and the mind of a nemonist is the story of a man um, who remembered virtually everything, the nemonist. The two cases are almost mirror images of each other as opposites. An amnesiac soldier and a man who remembered everything. The first we understand as a, tr as a tragic pathology. But as the great Jewish philosopher and historian Yosef Yerushalmi writes, quote, yet the phenomenon of the nemonist was no less pathological. If the brain damaged man could not remember, the nemonist could not forget. And so it was even difficult for him to read, not because like the man at the Battle of Smolensk, he had forgotten the meaning of words, but because each time he tried to read, other words and images surged up from the past and strangled the words and text he held in his hands." Unquote. This is sensory and mnemonic overload. The world and the text are too, both too crammed with remembered meanings for the individual to function. As Luria himself notes, many of us are anxious to find, many of us are anxious to find ways to improve our memories. None of us have to deal with the problem of how to forget. In this man's case, however, um, precisely the reverse was true. The big question for him and the most troublesome was how he could learn to forget, unquote. The nemonist haunting dilemma, I would suggest, is not unlike that confronted by Stephen Dedalus and indeed by the Irish people in the face of a traumatic colonial history. History, says Stephen famously, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. To describe history as a nightmare from which one wants to awake implies a complex relationship between the past, trauma, suffering, sleep, waking, forgetting, memory, amnesia, and repression. Similarly, as I've argued elsewhere, for Stephen and his fellow Irishmen, imperial history is very much an oppressive nightmare of the present from which it is hard to awake. If for no other reason, that, than that its oppressive presence and hegemonic discursive terminology is written all over the face of Ireland and of its cultural constructions, and thus forms the unavoidable hour by hour subtext and context of all their thoughts and experiences. As for example, in the Hades episode of Ulysses, um, as the funeral carriage conveys the Irishman first past the statue of William Smith O'Brien, a patriotic hero hero of the failed 1848 rebellion, 
then passed, quote, the huge cloak liberators form a Daniel O'Connell statue. Then, and could I have the next slide, please? Um, uh, then uh, passed Nelson's pillar, the hated uh, English imperial symbol named after Admiral Nelson. Um, then the foundation stone for Parnell, which is now the Parnell Memorial and Parnell Square uh, in Dublin and so on. The streets of Dublin become themselves a concrete text, which one is never allowed to forget, a constant reminder of one's oppressive colonial past and one's continued colonial subservience, denying the attractions of forgetting, denying the possibility of any relief from the nightmare of history. As with the Nemonist, then, the inability to forget and the sensory overload of too much memory produce an agonizing paralysis, a nightmare, from which one cannot awaken. Frederick Nietzsche has written that, quote, life in any true sense is absolutely impossible without forgetfulness. We must know the right time to forget as well as the right time to remember and instinctively see when it is necessary to feel historically and when unhistorically. This is the point that the reader is asked to consider that the historical and the unhistorical are equally necessary to the health of an individual a community, and a system of culture." Unquote. But if health lies somewhere between totally, total remembering and amnesia, between the nemonist and the soldier at Smolensk, what is the right balance? As Yeroshalmi asks, given the need both to remember and to forget, where are the lines to be drawn? How much history do, re do we require? What kind of history? What should we remember? What can we afford to forget? What must we forget? These questions are as unresolved today as they were then. They only have become more pressing, unquote. What should we forget and what should we remember? And when should we forget and when remember? If both activities are important to the health of an individual, they are perhaps also both important to the health of a nation or a people. Which, is, which of the two is more important? Which is the greater danger? Yerushalmi himself is unequivocal on this issue. Asked to consider what might be the uses of forgetting, he writes, the uses of forgetting? In the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, they are not to be found. The Bible only knows the terror of, forget, of forgetting. Forgetting the obverse of memory is always negative, the cardinal sin from which all others will flow. The key book, the key biblical text, Yerushalmi suggests, is to be found in the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy. Beware lest you forget the Lord your God so that you do not keep his commandments and judgments and ordinances, lest you lift up your hearts and forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it shall come to pass if you indeed forget the Lord your God, I bear witness against you this day that you shall utterly perish. These are biblical lines and injunctions which we might note were also significant to the Irish nationalist movement in Joyce's day, repeatedly imagining itself as Israelites remembering Zion so that they might uh, emerge out of the house of bondage. Next slide, please. In approaching Joyce, however, I want to turn first to Ernest Renan of the great 19th century French historian and one of the few staunch advocates of forgetting, or at least of the necessity of forgetting, perhaps even the collective will and urge to forget. This takes place in Renan's important and influential 1882 lecture, Qu'est-ce qu'une nation? What is a nation? Joyce read and admired Renan's work. Uh, Stephen Dedalus cites Renan three separate times in Stephen Hero, Renan is mentioned in the Cillian Charybdis episode of Ulysses, and Joyce, living in France, had visited Renan's birthplace at Tréguier in Brittany. Joyce was clearly familiar with a number of Renan's works, including, I would suggest, What is a Nation? Indeed, there are a number of passages in Joyce's own 1907 essay, Ireland, Isle of Saints and Sages, that seem almost direct echoes of passages and arguments in Renan's essay. Uh, I won't catalog these for you here. And of course, in the Cyclops episode of Ulysses, Leopold Bloom is asked to define what a nation is. Do you know what a nation means? Um, echoing Renan's famous question and title. 
What is a Nation is a remarkably enlightened essay for its time, anticipating and indeed helping fashion contemporary studies and understandings of nationalism and national identity. Whereas previous scholars had tried to define the nation by criteria such as race, uh, such as a race or an ethnic group having shared characteristics, Venant, in a revolutionary departure, defined it by the desire of a people to live together, which he articulated in his well known phrase, avoir faire de grand choses ensemble, vouloir en faire encore, to have performed great deeds together, to wish to perform still more. Venant writes, a nation is a soul, a spiritual principle. Two things which in truth are but one constitute this soul or spiritual principle. One lies in the past, one in the present. One is the, pos uh, pos possession, uh, one is the possession in common of a rich legacy of memories. The other is present day consent, the desire to live together, the will to perpetuate the value of the heritage that one has received in an undivided form. To have common glories in the past and to have common will in the present, to have performed great deeds together, to wish to perform still more. These are the essential conditions for being a people. And what is required to solidify this desire to live together as a nation, Renan argues, is the process of forgetting. For purposes of a nation's collective well being, some things are better forgotten. Quote, forgetting. I would even go so far as to say historical error is a crucial fact. Uh, if you would like me to, I don't- Please do, please do. I'll share my screen again and you can continue your talk. Okay. Okay, so, um, as, as I put it, um, uh, where we left off, I was mentioning that Benedict Anderson um, uh, um, extends Grenon's argument about national forgetting by noting the discursive process by which such forgetting takes place, in which the memory of brutal massacre and enmity is replaced by a revisionist story of family discord, a process of re-imaging such divisive memories as disagreements taking place, as it were, all in the family. Um, he cites Renan's argument about the St. Uh, Bartholomew massacre as an example of, quote, such a construction of national genealogies, retrospectively reimagined as reassuringly fratricidal wars between who else? Fellow Frenchmen. We become aware of a systematic historiographical campaign deployed by the state, mainly through the state school system, to remind every young French woman and Frenchman of a series of antique slaughters, which are now inscribed as family history. And um, unquote, Anderson goes on to cite various other examples, including how Americans are constantly taught to remember slash forget the war between the states as a civil war between brothers, unquote, rather than as one between what were at least for a while two sovereign states. Of the genealogy of English national identity, Anderson writes, English history textbooks offer the diverting spectacle of a great founding father whom every school child is taught to call William the Conqueror. Um, the same child is not informed that William spoke no English, indeed could not have done so since the English language did not exist in his epoch, epoch. Um, nor is he or she told conqueror of what? for the only intelligible modern answer would have to be conqueror of the English, which would turn that old Norman predator into a more successful precursor of Napoleon and Hitler. Hence, the conqueror operates as the same kind of ellipsis, we, or we might say amnesia, as La Saint Barthélemy, that is the Saint Bartholomew massacre, to remind one of something which it is immediately obligatory to forget. Norman William and Harold uh, Norman William and Saxon Harold thus meet on the battlefield of Hastings, if not as dancing partners, at least as brothers, unquote. It's a family affair. Perhaps in future generations, the troubles in Northern Ireland will also be thus retrospectively represented and reimagined as a fraternal spat within the Irish family, allowing both sides to forget their deep enmity and thus move on to a sense of collective and national commonality. This is how Anderson suggests 
a people construct a national narrative and identity, quote, all profound changes in consciousness by their very nature bring with them char characteristic amnesias. Out of such oblivions in specific historical circumstances spring narratives. But to serve the narrative purpose, these violent deaths must be remembered slash forgotten as our own, unquote. Yet the question arises whether such collective amnesia can be permanent or whether as uh, with, uh, or whether as with repressed memories and trauma victims, there will at some point emerge a return of the repressed. Indeed, one could well think of the cycles of genocidal violence during the 1990s in what was formerly Yugoslavia as the result of a return and resurfacing of repressed collective memories of ethnic conflicts and hatreds between Serbs, Croats and Bosnians uh, originating sometimes centuries earlier, all of which had been forgotten for a few decades, um, at least since the brutal ethnic strifes in the region during the 1940s in the process of unifying these different groups under the national identity of the Yugoslav Federation. Renan himself was conscious of such a threat and his warning almost seems now prescient in light of such recent genocides in places like Serbo, Croatia, Rwanda, and elsewhere, quote, be on your guard for this ethnographic politics is in no way a stable thing and if today you use it against others, tomorrow you may see it turned against yourselves. Can you be sure that the Germans who have raised the banner of ethnography so high will not see the Slavs in their turn analyze the names of villages in Saxony and Lusatia, search for any traces of the Wiltses or of the Arbitrites, and demand recompense for the massacres and the wholesale enslavements that the Atos inflicted upon their ancestors? It is good for everyone to know how to forget." Unquote. Joyce's texts are frequently concerned with the dynamics of forgetting, as well as with the continuing st contrasting struggle, I'm sorry, the contrasting struggle to hold on to the memory of the past. There are in Joyce's works many interesting cases of the psychological maneuvers and self-deceptions involved in the processes of remembering and forgetting. Polly Mooney in the boarding house, Maria in clay, both Stephen and Bloom in Ulysses and so on. But these are cases of individuals forgetting things. Um, in the, uh, now I wanna focus briefly on three passages in Ulysses in which individual forgetting becomes symptomatic of or connected to collective forgetting, to national, cultural and historical forgetting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next, a slide, uh, a slides provide the texts of the passages from Ulysses, uh, which I will be quoting from. The second chapter of Ulysses, the Nestor episode, an episode designed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an episode Joyce designated as concerning history begins with a history lesson. You, Cochrane, what city sent for him? Tarentum, sir, very good, well. There was a battle, sir, very good, where? The boy's blank face asked the blank window. Stephen's young student, Cochrane, is only partially able to recall the history of Pyrrhus's war against the Romans on behalf of the Tarentines. Tarentum was a minor Greek colony fighting against the powerful Romans. Thus the story and history Stephen is asking his class to remember is one of a battle against empire. But history, Stephen's interior thoughts suggest echoing Blake, history is quote, fabled by the daughters of memory. For memory, like Cochrane, has a hard time remembering facts and details and instead imagines fables or allegories. I forget the place, sir, 279 BC. Ah, Stephen said, glancing at the name and date in the Gorse Guard book. Yes, sir. And he said, another victory like that, and we are done for. That phrase the world had remembered, a dull ease of the mind. From the hill above a corpse-strewn a corpse -strewn plain, a general speaking to his officers. What gets remembered, Stephen realizes, is discourse. In this case, the famous phrase attributed to Pyrrhus, another victory like that, and we are done for. What gets forgotten and repressed in the distillation of a battle into a single phrase the world still remembers are the actual and material circumstances at Asculum that led to Pyrrhus's comment in the first place the facts behind the logic of a Pyrrhic victory, as we call it, 
That is the tremendous human slaughter and bloodshed that made another such victory unthinkable, even for the victors. Thus, Stephen's history book is gore-scarred in more ways than one, as it tells the story of a general, Pyrrhus, uh, speaking to his officers above a corpse-strewn plain, while the world remembers only that catchy phrase, uh, exercising a dull ease of the mind. The discursive collective memory whitewashes and simplifies painful or unpleasant historical details. What is forgotten in favor of discourse are gore and death. Although Stephen's uh, young Irish students uh, might be expected to identify with a battle fought by a small colony against a powerful empire, um, and, and could I have the next slide, uh, please? Um, for them too, Stephen thinks, um, history was a tale too often heard, their land a pawn shop. It is perhaps easier to want to forget, to exercise the, that dull ease of the mind. Stephen himself, however, like Loria's nemonist, sees too much and cannot forget. For him, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake, but cannot. Even the game of hockey, field hockey, that the students go on to play at recess at this point, reminds Stephen of the ugly dynamics embodied in such play, which mimics and sometimes enacts actual violence. Again, he hears, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies in a medley, the joust of life. Jousts, time shock rebounds, shock by shock. Jousts, slush and uproar battles, the frozen death spew of the slain, a shout of spear spikes baited with men's bloodied guts. The game itself is imaged by Stephen as training and preparation for battle and for killing, as in the well-known phrase about the playing fields of Eton, Eton as training grounds for a male ideology and tradition of blood and warfare, as the sounds and sticks, the sounds of sticks clashing and jousting for rebounds are but preludes to the gore-scarred and corpse-strewn plains of war that await these young boys um, when they grow up. Time-shocked rebounds, shock by shock. Jousts, slush and uproar of battles, the frozen death spew of the slain, a shout of spear spikes baited with men's bloodied guts. Again, what we forget and repress are blood and corpses. What we, re what we remember are stories and witty phrases, another victory like that, or the playing fields of Eton, the very discursive products that elide the gore-scarred and corpse-strewn plains behind them. So also contemporary discursive euphemisms like friendly fire and collateral damage sanitize and mask the reality that what we are really talking about is blood and death. Canon argues that national identity and unity for a nation, such unity is obviously desi desirable. For an empire, such unity is even more desirable but perhaps harder to achieve. For from the imperialist standpoint, it is important for a colony and its quest to bury the bloodstained hatchet as if, uh, to bury the bloodstained hatchet as it were, if they are to reimagine re their own collective identity and future as a happy part of the empire. But for Stephen, a member of the conquered race, history is not so easily forgotten or repressed. In other words, it is the victors who would most want to forget past atrocities. It is the losers who most need to not forget. It is, easy for, uh, it is easier for Stephen's students, well off and comfortable under the empire, quote, well off people, proud that their eldest son was in the Navy, living in exclusive and expensive neighborhoods like um, the, v the Vico Road Docky, and sending their boys uh, to an expensive school, aware of their of the fees their papas pay, a, a school run by an Ulsterman, a Northern Irish Protestant. It is easier for them to forget the troubled past of Ireland, a, a tale like any other too often heard, than for a poor Catholic like Stephen, obsessed with the nightmare of history. And no one in Ulysses forgets more easily than Garrett Deasy, the headmaster and Stephen's boss at the school. A Protestant and an Ulsterman, a member of the Anglo-Irish ascendancy, Deasy ironically accuses Stephen of forgetfulness. You think me an old fogey and an old Tory. I saw three generations since O'Connell's time. I remember the famine in 46. 
Do you know that the Orange Law just agitated for the repeal of the Union 20 years before O'Connell did, or the, before the prelates of your communion denounced him as a demagogue? You Fenians forget some things. But it is Deasy himself who repeatedly forgets um, or misremembers or distorts historical facts whether it is in quoting Shakespeare's put but money in thy purse, uh, Iago, Stephen reminds him, hardly a good role model, um, in claiming that a French Celt came up with a line that on the British empire, the sun never sets, or that Catholic prelates uh, denounced Daniel O'Connell. And he is certainly wrong um, in his self-satisfied announcement to Stephen that Ireland, they say, has the honor of being the only country which has never persecuted the Jews. And do you know why? Because she never let them in. Forgetting is a convenient luxury of the winners. It is clear, clearly beneficial to the unity of a sovereign state or empire for its subjects to be able to forget the history of bloody conquest if they are to partake, partake in a collective identity as members of such sovereignty. For the recalcitrant members of a subject colony resisting imperial rule, however, forgetting is for that same reason preside, precisely not desirable. It is the pre-conquest past, the traditional native culture that one must hold on to, that one must try to reclaim, must try to still remember Zion by the rivers of Babylon, all the while not allowing oneself to be contaminated by the attractions of empire by the flesh pots of Egypt, as it were. Such remembering, however, can also be clouded by the discourse of nostalgia, and as I've argued elsewhere, by the discourses, the discourses of purity and authenticity, and is unable to incorporate present realities and hybridities into its logic, including the cultural hybridity and cosmopolitanism of many of, of its own citizens, such as Stephen Dedalus, Buck Mulligan, or, or Oscar Wilde for it would freeze Irishness in the nostalgic purity of a dead past, doomed to extinction in the face of modernity and history. How then can such a discourse deal with emigration, so important after all in cultural history, unless it demand that in Bruce Robinson's words, the eyes of the emigrant can only be trained on his lost home. For it is the native soil and the homeland so consecrated in Irish songs as the old sod, the holy ground, the wee bit of green, and so on, that have to remain the only touchstones possible, the only images that can be allowed to be in one's memory continually in order to maintain a nostalgic cultural identity that denies the existence of any other sorts of experience as genuine and acceptable. This logic presents a real dilemma for any modern Irish person who, like Gabriel Conroy in The Dead or like Joyce himself, interacts with modern English or continental cultures, but especially so for the Irish exile, whether wild goose or emigrant, who is away from home but who wishes to maintain his or her Irishness. Quote, the wild goose Kevin Egan of Paris in Ulysses is a case in point. A portrait of the Fenian Joseph Casey, uh, the Fenians would of course eventually be, uh, uh, become the IRA. Um, uh, the a portrait of the Fenian Joseph Ken Casey who was imprisoned for his involvement in acts of Fenian, viola Fenian violence in England. Joyce's Kevin Egan is a Fenian espousing the discourse of Irish nationalism and authenticity, but ironically stranded in the center of internationalism and cosmopolitanism. Paris. This is an irony not lost on his son Patrice, Stephen's friend, who tells Stephen. Um, uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, this is an irony not lost, as I said, on his son, uh, on Egan's son Patrice, uh, Stephen's friend, who tells Stephen, C'est tordant, vous savez. Moi, je suis socialiste. Je ne crois pas en l'existence de Dieu. Faut pas le dire à mon père. My translation, um, it's hilarious, you know? Me, I'm a socialist. I don't believe in the existence of God. Don't tell my father that. Like Patrice, Stephen too is a free thinker living in Paris, eating mou en civet uh, in his Latin Quarter hat when I was in Paris, boule miche. The Boulevard Saint-Michel, a major boulevard in the Latin Quarter on the Seine's left bank, was of course the cafe center of student and bohemian life at the turn of the century and still is. 
Um, in such an environment, the Fenian Kevin Egan tries to hold on to home and to the memory of the past. At Rodos Patisserie, 9 Boulevard Saint Michel, um, uh, he speaks uh, to Stephen, quote, of Ireland, of Dalcassians, of hopes, conspiracies of Arthur Griff. And he complains about the degeneracy and sexual excess of Parisians. Licentious men, the froken bonne à faire who rubs male nakedness in the bath of Uppsala. Moi faire, she said, tous les monsieur. Not this monsieur, I said, most licentious custom. Bath a most private thing. I wouldn't let my brother, not even my own brother, most lascivious thing, lascivious people. The repeated refrain of lascivious people in the, context, uh, in the context of massages and baths, suggest a paranoid fear of the foreign and degenerate, the flesh pots of Egypt, all embodied in the Parisian bohemianism and cosmopolitan free thinking indulged in by Stephen and indeed by um, uh, Egan's own son, Patrice. Rather, Egan tries to teach his son to sing the boys of Kilkenny and to keep his mind, his mind focused on home uh, quote unquote, as defined by a discourse identifying Irishness as the agrarian, Catholic, and Republican West of Ireland, um, the nostalgic discourse glorified by the Fenianism through which he defines himself. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Stephen ruefully notes, in gay Paris he hides, Egan of Paris, unsought any save by me. They have forgotten Kevin Egan, not he them remembering thee, O Zion. Like the Israelites remembering Zion by the rivers of Babylon, Egan continues to train his eyes on the past and on the native soil of an authentic Ireland, trying not to forget while he is stranded by the boulevards of a latter-day Babylon. Unable to admit or incorporate, uh, incorporate hybrid and foreign experiences as part of his own complex identity, he lives in an authentic past already frozen in nostalgia. So what the subject race and the recalcitrant, recalcitrant subject like Kevin Egan of a resistant colony really hold on to, what they remember, Joyce shows us, is not actual memories so much as rosy tinted sentimentalism and nostalgia, which is itself a forgetting of sorts. This is also true of the so-called citizen in the Cyclops episode and of the particular brand of nationalist discourse which he espouses and represents. But in the interest of time, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this whole, uh, uh, much of this last section uh, and move to my conclusion. And uh, Alex, and I'm done uh, at this point with the slides. I would like at the conclusion of this talk to return to the topic brief, uh, briefly to the topic of amnesia. As with my own amnesia fantasies as a youth, Stephen Dedalus would like to slough off the nightmare of history, which so weighs him down and from which he cannot awake. But like Lurie as Nemanis, he remembers too much, is much too keenly aware of the pawn shop of history that is ours. Indeed, Joyce shows us how the losers, the victims of colonialism or conquest, need desperately to remember, to hold on to the past, cannot afford to forget. But he also shows us how such remembering is itself a distortion and travesty of historical memory. Rather, at the level of nations and empires, the fascination with amnesia is a collective will to forget the unpleasantness of the past on the part of the winners, um, a Renanesque drive uh, for national or imperial unity by forgetting the atrocities of the past. For Renan, this was a necessity uh, for communal and national harmony. For Joyce, this is an elision and suppression of minority positions and groups that don't fit into the dominant view of national unity, as with Dizzy's claims about the, Jew, the Jews not existing in Ireland. Recall Nietzsche and uh, Yaroshalmi's questions about how much we should remember and how much we should forget. Quote, given both the need to remember and to forget, where are the lines to be drawn? How much history do we require? What kind of history? What should we remember? What can we afford to forget? What must we forget? Joyce's Ulysses, indeed, points out the danger of both, uh, 
forgetting and remembering. Uh, for in Ulysses, even remembering, as we have seen, can be a kind of forgetting, a Renanesque covering up of brutal realities and facts. Both Renanesque versions of both Renan's versions of national forgetting slash unity, as with DZ, and Irish nationalists remembering slash nostalgia, as with Kevin Egan or The Citizen, both of them gloss over the complex realities of the diverse composition and frequently corpse prune material realities of the Irish people and their history. Given the choice between too much memory and too little, Yerushalmi takes a very clear stance, quote, I will, take this, this, I will take my stand on the side of too much rather than too little, for my terror of forgetting is greater than my terror of having too much to remember, unquote. After all, he points out, we live in a world in which, and this is even more true in our contemporary moment, uh, he points out, we live in a world in which, quote, it is no longer merely a question of the decay of collective memory and the declining consciousness of the past, uh, of the, but of also the aggressive rape of whatever memory remains, the deliberate distortion of the historical record, the invention of mythological pasts in the service of the powers of darkness. Against the agents of oblivion, the shredders of documents, the assassins of memory, the revisers of encyclopedias, the conspirators of silence, against those who in Milan Kund Kundera's wonderful image can airbrush a man out of a photograph so that nothing is left of him but his hat, only the historian with the austere passion for fact, proof, evidence which are central to his vocation can effectively stand guard." Unquote. This position, I would suggest, is essentially Joyce's stance too. I'd better stop there. Thank you all very much for your patience and for sticking with me. Dr. Chang, thank you so much for those really stirring comments. Um, this is such an important conversation for us to be having at this particular moment in our history and judging by the comments, I know that many in attendance agree uh, with that sentiment. Um, it is, I see um, already after eight, but what I would like to do is eight, eight oh nine. What I would like to Again, do is- Again, I apologize terribly for uh, the technical mal malfunction. No worries. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to hear the conclusion of your talk and um, the audience is very grateful to your son as well for the technical assistance he provided. So please pass that message on to him. What I would like to propose is that we maybe spend 10 to 15 minutes um, doing some question and answer. I mean, of course, of course, anyone in the virtual audience who has other engagements has to head out, that's fine, but we'll just continue for 10 to 15 minutes. I, I see that we have some questions coming in. Uh, for those of you who have not yet entered your questions in the chat or Q&A box, please do so. But I'm just going to start with um, the earliest question that, that I see in our chat box. Quote, wonderful talk so far, also timely given our trouble in America today over slavery, which is best for our identity, confronting our ugly past or forgetting it? How do we find a balance? Not a small question, but obviously a very pertinent one. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Uh, in my book on Amnesia and the Nation, I have a whole two, ch the final two chapters are precisely about this question. Um, uh, what do, uh, how are we uh, in, the Amer in the United States, uh, how do we confront uh, the Civil War and the American South? How are we to forget it? Um, uh, uh, or can we forget it? Um, here, in the case of the South, I think it's a case of, of um, white people, especially in the South, but a lot of white people elsewhere, wanting to forget uh, the past, uh, 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 the un un uncomfortable past, um, and uh, not, and having the sort of the defensive fragility really of, uh, of feeling uh, their positions as white people perhaps threatened by having to remember the Tulsa race massacre, having uh, what uh, slavery was really all about, um, 
buying into the lost cause mythology explanation of slavery. And this is a very difficult and crucial question because on the one hand, you know, um, uh, should we, um, partly precisely because of some of the arguments I brought up today, um, I have mixed feelings about, for example, the, the movement to try to dis destroy um, uh, Confederate monuments and statues. Um, we don't want to be uh, li uh, like so many, uh, uh, like the Soviet empire tearing down uh, the history of the past. Uh, we don't want to be like the Chinese erasing any uh, trace of the Tiananmen massacre um, and pretending these things didn't happen. What we need is to have a balanced way of talking about what did happen without uh, sort of nostalgic visions of what uh, uh, of um, what uh, some people would like to believe happened, especially the loss, nostalgic loss cause um, version of Southern history as uh, uh, that uh, we uh, that really the slaves liked their white masters and uh, the war wasn't really fought over slavery. It was the war of Northern aggression. I know I'm rambling. It's a big topic that I actually uh, talk about a lot and write about a lot, but that is a great and relevant question, whoever asked it. Thank you. I'm going to be self-indulgent and ask a question myself, which is um, what do you think the future is with well, the present state of you know, the field of taking a um, post-colonial approach to Joyce studies. What are the ne what, are, what are the next steps in the, the sort of analysis that you are um, pursuing in, in, in your talk this evening? Um, what are some of the questions that you think remain to be answered in terms of this particular scholarly approach to the subject? Well, Alex, it depends, I think, on what you do mean here by the subject. Um, Post-colonial studies itself, um, almost everybody who engages in it doesn't like the term post-colonial studies. Um, we are in no way past imperialism, colonialism, uh, and really in a lot of ways, um, the kind of work I've been doing in the past few years and continue to try to do um, feels in some ways like, you know, People say, well, I'm poaching uh, on uh, the, uh, the discipline of history, especially American history these days. I think it's hard to distinguish anymore studies of nationalism, identity, diversity, race, um, and media, uh, because what we're really seeing in all of these fields um, uh, is um, uh, attempts at manipulating truth, um, conspiracy theories, attempts to suppress history um, in favor, uh, in the, uh, uh, for purposes of, of nationalistic uh, self-gain or personal self-gain. Um, and how we divide what we call imperialism and colonialism from economic imperialism, from uh, 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 first world versus third world um, uh, is something that even something like the pandemic has made absolutely clear to us. Uh, there's just no way to talk only about Irish history or about American history. Um, does, Alex, am I touching on your question in some ways? Absolutely. I, I mean, um, you know, I, I was thinking as I was talking about the orange marches in Belfast, uh, in Northern Ireland, which are gonna start again um, uh, on July 1st, a white horse day and the, the all, the, actually all of July starting on, uh, um, can be particularly difficult this year, uh, not because um, of, of the process of forgetting that has be, had begun in 1998 with a Good Friday Agreement, 
but because of a Brexit, um, that the threat of a return to a hard border in Northern Ireland is making everybody uncomfortable and the paramilitary groups are back uh, at a, a state of high alert. It is hard anymore to divide um, uh, identity and na national issues into uh, separate boxes. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, I feel like the conversation we've had tonight around James Joyce's Ulysses and our, the, the challenges we face in our modern world has been really vital. And I'm so you know, deeply um, humbled and honor, honored, Dr. Chang, that you joined us at the Rosenbach as part of our Bloom's Day celebrations for this really important analysis. I again want to remind everyone uh, in our virtual audience that if you enjoyed this conversation and found it vital and engaging, please do check out our installation, The Global Other Race and Empire in James Joyce's Ulysses. On site, if you have the chance, visit the Gallery Gateway online exhibition portal uh, from the comfort of your own home and um, visit our website to learn more about other Bloomsday offerings uh, this, this month. Um, thank you again, Dr. Cheng, for joining us. Thank you to everyone in the audience for being a part of our conversation and our community this evening. And we look forward to seeing you online and in person for other programs very, very soon. Thank you all and good night. Happy Bloomsday next week to all of you.